Um, so I'll be talking about kind of the two faces of the coin. I'll be talking about when FPGAs, at least in my personal experience, were not good at deep learning. And then I'll describe three ways in which we can really use FPGAs in amazing ways for deep learning. Um, so I won't really give a background on deep learning or anything. If, if you don't know what that is, at this point, you should kind of go read a blog post and come back. Um, but I will start with giving a retrospective of DLA. This is the deep learning accelerator that I worked on during my time at Intel, which was around in 2016. Um, and this is the part where I think it didn't go as well as, uh, as I thought for FPGAs in the area of deep learning. So, um, so again, to set kind of the stage, we're in 2016. Uh, NVIDIA just released their Pascal architecture. And it's, uh, I think, the first GPU that actually had native support for FP16 for half precision floating point. It had a healthy kind of 20 teraflops of that. Uh, and it's also the first GPU that's starting adding these kind of uh, specialized instructions, things like a four way dot product using a single instruction instead of the conventional fused multiply add that um, GPUs had. And we were kind of a really small team at Intel. I remember we were five engineers and 11 interns at one point. Uh, and we were trying to basically take on that Pascal architecture. We thought FPGAs had what it takes to, you know, uh, outperform Pascal or outperform GPUs on deep learning inference, at least at batch one and at least at low latency regimes, right? And so we built this deep learning accelerator. We built hardware for it and software. And we basically were hoping to be GPUs in that case. And so I'll tell you the story of, of what happened there. And I'll focus on kind of three optimizations that we really thought would give us the leg up. Uh, and I'll, I'll also describe how it didn't quite work as we thought it would. So uh, the first optimization or the first key thing that we focused on was arithmetic. Uh, GPUs were already noticed, you know, uh, that arithmetic is very important and that uh, deep neural networks were tolerant to lower precision arithmetic, things like FP16. Uh, but you can also, you can only, you know, do what's embedded on the GPU. In this case, it was FP16. Uh, and floating point arithmetic, you know, if you don't remember, it has a sign, exponent, and an abscissa. And so we came up with this, you know, uh, block floating point format, uh, or maybe we used it. I don't know if we came up with it. Uh, but the idea there is that we don't need all of the mantissa bits in our, or even all of the exponent bits in our floating point number. And in fact, we found that FP11 was a really uh, good format that worked really well for deep neural networks. Even if we take the neural network and we quantize it post-training and we don't do any fine tuning, that was basically sufficient to get the kind of the highest accuracy for that neural network. Further, we took kind of a block of eight numbers in this example or different block sizes, and we aligned them all to the same exponent. Um, and so what this gave us was, uh, you know, basically we can now do arithmetic on the sign and mantissa separately, and then realign them to another exponent and produce a floating point number. And what this means is that we can do integer math instead of floating point math on the FPGA, and that was way more efficient. Um, so for kind of to show a visual example, this is a floating point adder. You have a lot of shifters, you have a lot of alignment units, a lot of you know, sign computation and various things, whereas the integer adder would be just this unit here, which you know, adds um, the two mantises together. And so integer uh, addition or integer multiplication for that matter is much more efficient um, than its floating point counterpart. And we thought you know, uh, this was the first key thing that we had to focus on. And the results were great. You know, because we stored our model in this block floating point format, we actually used way less memory than we would have done. So we used two and a half X less memory. Um, so in this example here, we're using 53 bits instead of 128. And we had an order of magnitude in terms of area reduction, which allowed us to scale up our accelerator and make it much faster. Uh, we also organized our multipliers in a systolic array, which is something you can't do with GPUs. So GPUs have to synchronize over their on-chip memory, things like register files, which costs almost as much as the arithmetic unit itself. Uh, whereas we can forward data directly from one PE to the next PE without uh, synchronizing over memory, which was also an advantage that you can do this on FPGAs. And so at this point, we were feeling pretty good about ourselves. And we started looking at the next thing. Uh, GPUs, um, you know, they have this programming overhead. And you know, from slides from NVIDIA people uh, here, uh, it's showing kind of the fused multiply add, how much energy it consumes, and the control overhead just for that instruction is about 20 times the energy it takes to do a fused multiply add. Uh, 
right? So things like, you know, instruction fetch, instruction decode, um, uh, operand, um, loading the operands from the register files and doing all of that stuff uh, costs a lot of overhead, right? Uh, and then, you know, with the Pascal architecture, they already started in introducing these more coarser grain operations, things like a four-way dot product in a single operation. So you were doing four times the um, kind of arithmetic work with the same operation and with the same overhead. And so that overhead, you know, um, became four times less. It became just 5x. But that was still a very high overhead um, for uh, if you want to pay it for just doing some arithmetic. And we thought, you know, on FPGAs, we can do much better because we can define our own instruction set uh, and we can define our own hardware and we can define the granularity of our operations in whatever way we want. And so that's the first thing that we did. We came up with these very coarse grained instructions. So um, basically do convolution was one instruction, do max pooling, do linear layer, matrix small. These, these were very coarse grained operations. And we didn't stop there. We didn't actually send these um, instructions to hardware and decode them on hardware, which is conventionally what you would do for a programmable accelerator. We decoded the instructions in software in a, in a kind of a software unit that we called the assembler. And what came out of that assembler was something that we called config data. And that was basically, you know, specific counter values that went into our hardware and enable bits that went into various kernels and, you know, multiplexer control bits and things like that. So it was literally kind of the, the controlled data that's going to the accelerator. So, you know, conventionally you would have instructions, uh, you would have an instruction decode unit in hardware, and usually that's kind of the frequency bottleneck. And whenever you support a new instruction, you need to update this unit and make sure it still, you know, has good timing and a good delay. And then you need to find a way to kind of broadcast these instructions to all of your kernels, things like, you know, obviously dot product array, um, you know, different uh, activation functions, pooling and crossbars, so the different kernels you have in hardware. But what we did instead, as I said, you know, we decoded these instructions in software, and we had a very lightweight kernel called the VLIW reader, which read this config data. And then we had a very lightweight unidirectional network on chip that forwarded this configuration data to all kernels in what we call the configuration phase before uh, using the accelerator for uh, the actual acceleration. And so, you know, the, the config packet would kind of move along this network and uh, useful or, um, you know, the required configuration data would be deposited in the kernels as uh, the config packet made its way around. And it had no performance overhead because we overlapped this with the execution of the previous layer. Uh, and it had, you know, a tiny kind of area overhead. This whole thing cost about 1% overhead in terms of area, and it was very scalable because it's a network on chip, it's a, like a unidirectional ring, I guess, um, it, uh, you could easily kind of attach a new kernel, for example, um, without you know, changing anything else, really. You didn't change the BLIW reader, you changed a few things in software to add support for this new kernel and to add the configuration data required for this new kernel, but then you simply attached it off of the end of the uh, configuration network and it worked out of the box. Um, so again, we were feeling good about ourselves now compared to this 500% overhead the GPUs have for uh, executing kind of a four-way dot product. We had a very small overhead in terms of efficiency, at least uh, a very small area overhead of supporting this lightweight way of um, programming our accelerator. And we moved a lot of the complexity actually to software. And then, you know, speaking of new kernels, we also had a very custom way of adding new kernels. At that point, we really thought, you know, the silver bullet would be, you know, as soon as a new kind of primitive comes up in the deep learning world, we'll be able to support it. And we had kind of a configurable, uh, we called it crossbar, but it's actually a depopulated uh, custom interconnect uh, that we generated. And we were able to connect any new kernel to it, just showing um, kind of max pooling and local response normalization here. But we also used this to kind of connect an LSTM uh, dedicated kernel we looked at it for element-wise uh, operations as well. And we would automatically generate with adaptation to basically build these kernels as big as only as big as they need to be. So if it's used just once in the network, it would be very small and doesn't have to be very high bandwidth. But if it's kind of the performance bottleneck, then we can scale it up or scale it down as we want. And so this is something you can't do on GPUs, right? If, if you have a new primitive, you can write a new software kernel for it, but you were stuck with the same hardware. In this case, we had this ability of hardware accelerating any new primitive that comes up. 
And so we thought, you know, this configurability is a really kind of key feature here. Um, another, you know, key feature of our hardware is that, you know, we didn't actually need to build a generic overlay that ran all neural networks all the time. Um, we actually customized the, you know, the precision, um, the, 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 parallel, the parallelization factors, and even the balance between on-chip memory and compute to exactly match our workload. So if our neural network has a, a you, know, you know, you all know kind of the roofline plots where we look at the operational intensity of the workload and then the compute versus memory trade-off of the hardware, we can exactly match our hardware to each neural network uh, through kind of a design space exploration framework. And so again, uh, you know, you can change the hardware in GPUs. So this we thought was, was a really kind of uh, strong feature. So, um, so at that time also back, you know, 2016, 2017, um, more sophisticated networks were kind of being invented. So we, we move, we're moving from AlexNet to GoogleNet and ResNet and so on. And they had kind of very interesting structures. Um, they weren't really feed, uh, they were still feed forward in many cases, but they had a lot of branches and things like that. So to make sure we used our on-chip memory very carefully, we actually built out this uh, kind of full featured graph compiler, which had a lot of focus on managing the on-chip memory. And I'll show just an example of that. Um, so in this slide here, uh, I'm just kind of going to show two ways of allocating memory in our on-chip buffer. Um, and at this point, I should also mention, you know, FPGAs have slightly more on-chip memory than most GPUs, um, at least if we compare it to the register files on GPUs. And it's all explicitly managed memory. It's all very flexible in terms of these block RAMs or these plot RAMs or, or registers. And so, um, kind of careful use of this on-chip memory could also be a major advantage uh, in, uh, in using FPGAs. And so, um, so yeah, so I was going to show an example here where, you know, this thing is my memory, uh, my on-chip memory laid out linearly. Uh, and I'll show two ways of allocating tensors to it. One of them is wrong, one of them is right. And our software kind of handled this. Uh, in the first case, you know, we're allocating a tensor A. And then when we allocate a tensor B, we have the option of putting it right next to A uh, or putting it on the other end of the buffer. Obviously, the second one is better because once we deallocate A, we end up with a fragmented buffer in the first case, whereas we end up with a contiguous buffer in the second case. So this is an example of the kind of thing that we cared about during allocation. And kind of a more real example of that uh, showing here uh, the scheduling of this inception module in memory over multiple time steps. Basically, by... Um, but we modeled this as like a 2D Tetris, basically. Like we were trying to fit those two-dimensional space-time um, shapes of the tensors into our um, space-time uh, diagram of our memories. And by just changing the traversal order of this graph only slightly to take into account kind of larger tensors first, we were able to save kind of the utilization of on-chip memory for GoogleNet by about 30%. And so that really kind of highlighted the importance of software but also highlighted kind of these key optimizations that we can perform on our explicitly managed uh, local memory. So, um, so yeah, so I mean, um, for a very short period of time, we really thought, you know, we can win. Uh, we, we had this, you know, block mini float. We had uh, a very efficient numerical format. Uh, we had a very lightweight way of configuring delay. Uh, we had very sophisticated, you know, on-chip memory management passes to make sure we get, you know, all the juice out of whatever memory we have on chip. Um, we had this extra, you know, silver bullet of customization. So if there are new kernels that come out, then you know we can implement them in hardware right away. We also had different uh, optimizations, things like Winograd and other things that I that I didn't talk about. And we, you know, we thought that tips the scales in our favor, uh, kind of. And remember, we're competing against Pascal, which has you know twenty teraflops of FP16 which isn't a small number, but it isn't, you know, it, it isn't huge either. It's, it's, it's manageable. We can compete with that. And it had this, you know, um, the best instruction it had for deep learning was a four-way dot product that had 500% control overhead uh, or overhead rather. Um, so it was, um, it was kind of a heavy slow moving device as well, at least compared to other devices that are available now. And so, yeah, so for this brief period of time, we thought we were on top. Um, uh, in our imagination, at least, you know, NVIDIA was sad, Jensen was really sad, and, you know, we were really happy. Um, of course, in the following year, Volta was released. Um, and in Volta, 
you know, they added these tensor cores. And tensor cores uh, meant that they were able to add these half precision matrix small uh, operations. And these can multiply two 16 by 16 matrices in a single operation with only the overhead of about 27% in terms of um, control. And so that 500% shrunk to 27% in one year. Um, in terms of, um, you know, peak teraflops, the device had five times as many peak teraflops as the Pascal architecture. So they really doubled down on low precision arithmetic. And if we look at these numbers today, it's like 2000 teraflops in the hopper architecture. And even our you know, beloved mini float was now supported on GPUs. So we are, you now have 4,000 teraflops of mini float FP8 on hopper GPUs as well. And so in that case, you know, um, I think in, in my mind, at least NVIDIA is much happier and you know, FPGAs aren't really on their radar. Uh, we're not kind of competing in the same market or in the same kind of uh, competition at least anymore and i mean the key thing here is that you know many many of the optimizations that we did things like to amortize overhead to have a really small um, overhead of instructions that was adapted by gpus to have a uh, kind of an innovative um, arithmetic or low precision arithmetic that was adapted by gpus um yeah so so there were many things that we relied on that was you know, uh, you know, adapted and used in GPUs and other ASICs as well later. And that meant that FPGAs were always behind because, you know, um, FPGAs uh, are fundamentally less efficient than ASICs. They're about an order of magnitude less efficient in terms of area and power, and they're about three to four times slower uh, on average. And so these things weren't enough to compensate for that, you know, FPGA versus ASIC uh, gap. Um, and so, you know, towards my, the end of my time at Intel, we wrote up a paper about you know, what we've been working on at the high level. We described various, you know, compiler passes and the hardware. And, you know, uh, these guys that I worked with um, at Intel, they were a dream team, really were kind of an amazing set of people. Uh, and kind of further testament as to how badly we lost at competition against GPUs. You know, all of these guys are now at different chip startups where they do have a much better chance of outperforming GPUs in the deep learning game. Um, and so, yeah, so um, at least I'm rooting for them. Uh, we'll see what happens there. Um, so, so this is kind of um, the end of part one, uh, which is the more somber, kind of um, less happy, more sad uh, kind of part of the talk, I would say. Uh, and kind of going through this retrospective of um, building FPGA accelerators um, on uh, FPGA-based accelerators for deep learning. And I will say that kind of, I'm just talking about my experience. So obviously there are other accelerators out there that work really well and that, you know, leverage features that um, uh, are not possible to do on GPUs and they can get great uh, performance that way. I'm just describing kind of what happened uh, at least when I was with Intel um, four years ago now. Um, and so the key thing is, you know, it's kind of obvious, but if you can build it onto an ASIC, if it's a general enough feature that can be hardened into an ASIC, then it won't be competitive on an FPGA. Uh, I know it's a very anticlimactic and very obvious conclusion to this story, but, um, but that's basically what, what I learned uh, from the two years I spent there. So now on to kind of the more interesting part of this talk, uh, and it's, you know, is there still hope for FPGAs in the deep learning space? Um, and I really think there is. Uh, FPGAs are wonderful devices. They're the only thing that you can configure or reconfigure in hardware. And I'll talk about three ways in which um, I started some work already to kind of see how well FPGAs can uh, operate in deep, for deep learning. Also, I'll talk about, you know, um, three different things. Um, they're kind of, things that we started working on, but they mainly constitute my current and future work as well. So it will be kind of, um, in some cases, half complete ideas that I'm discussing uh, at a more kind of abstract level. But I think that's what could make them interesting. So the first one I call uh, AutoML code design. And, you know, at Intel, uh, when we were building DLA, uh, because we have this FPGA, we waited for people to tell us, you know, what is the best deep neural network architecture? Now, first it was AlexNet, obviously, then quickly became ResNet. And, you know, our job as hardware engineers was to go and optimize our hardware and software to run this workload really efficiently. Um, and that is kind of conventionally what we do as FPGA engineers. But with deep learning especially, I would like to advocate for 
a co-design framework. The deep learning workload is very flexible. It's not rigid at all. It's not like building, you know, an AES encryption uh, thing on an FPGA or a specific protocol or, or even a compression method that has to adhere to a specific standard or something. It is, it is multiplies and adds that can be organized in any way. And as long as you can train them using backpropagation and get good enough accuracy, then it will work. So, um, so I'd really advocate for kind of co-optimizing both the hardware and DNN together, as opposed to just optimizing the hardware to fit the deep neural network. And for context, uh, let me uh, tell you about automated machine learning. So actually when I left Intel, I didn't go and work for one of those chip startups, I worked for Samsung. Um, and there we really focused on this idea of neural architecture research. And so at a very high level, and it's in its most kind of simple form, you have an intelligent search algorithm that proposes a deep neural network architecture. Let's say it proposes this green one here. Uh, so this neural network would then be evaluated using an evaluator, which gives us accuracy. In this case, it just trained it, gave us the accuracy. We would take that accuracy, feed it back to our search algorithm, and slowly it would kind of influence the search algorithm to propose you know, a better neural network. In this case, this yellow one here, which would have a higher accuracy. And so if we do this repeatedly, that's called neural architecture search um, and specifically sample-based neural architecture search. And we can use many fancy algorithms here, things like you know, reinforcement learning, uh, genetic and evolutionary algorithms, where there are even differentiable methods um, to use here in the search or optimization algorithm. Um, and again, the kind of the key observation is that you know, this has become the norm for designing neural networks now in the industry. Um, you don't just take, you know, efficient net or ResNet off the shelf and use it. I mean, sometimes you do that, but if you're a bigger lab or a bigger group, you usually customize the neural network to your exact, you know, uh, accuracy target or whatever target you have. And so the key thing I want you to take from this slide is that different DNNs can perform the same task. You can change the algorithm, you can change the structure, you can change the topology, uh, it's fine. And so, uh, as I said, at Samsung, we really had a big focus on that, mainly because we didn't want to just focus on accuracy as an objective, but we wanted to customize the neural networks to run on Samsung phones in this case. So Samsung is a device company. So, uh, so it's different than you know, Google, Amazon, Facebook, because these guys have data centers. They have a lot of compute there, and their business is mainly to get your data through the data center um, to kind of use it for making your ads better or something. And so, um, and so, uh, so they're in the data center business and they might not care as much about running things on device, whereas Samsung is a device company, they sell devices. They want these devices to still be smart. So they want to run the AI algorithms on the device itself as well. Um, so, um, so what we were doing there is, you know, we had our search algorithm again, propose a deep neural network, but when we're evaluating it, we didn't just look at accuracy. We also looked at latency on that specific device. So we ran the neural network on the device, we got the latency and then fed back to the searching algorithm. Uh, typically we would put kind of a latency threshold. So within three milliseconds of inference, uh, what is the best accuracy that I can get? And we would keep optimizing this neural network structure until we find um, that accuracy. And so at Samsung, I kind of worked on a couple of, um, a few different applications actually, in which we used hardware aware neural architecture search. So in this case, you know, the hardware is fixed. In one case, it was the Samsung TVs uh, where we were building a kind of a super resolution network based on generative adversarial networks. Uh, and we were able to shrink it by about 30X just by uh, adding it to our uh, kind of neural architecture search framework. Um, in another case, we were trying to implement the uh, kind of speech assistant on Samsung phones to be actually implemented on device instead of having kind of a call to the server and coming back with the result. We wanted it all to happen on device. And so in this case, we achieved kind of a 5X compression um, compared to an unoptimized version, uh, just by kind of adding this hardware spec to the automated machine learning formulation. And so, so why did they say all that? Why am I talking about automated machine learning and neural architecture search? I'm talking about it to convince you that changing the neural network architecture is the norm now in industry, um, you change it to fit your hardware. Uh, but then we have these FPGAs which, in which you can change the hardware. You know, it's a reconfigurable hardware. And so uh, this leads me to kind of, you know, the natural thing is to put both into an auto formulation to have co-design neural architecture search is what we called it. 
And so uh, now our searching algorithm will propose uh, a deep neural network architecture, but it would also propose some kind of hardware. So it would build both the hardware and the neural architecture uh, in tandem. And then when we evaluate it, we will train the deep neural network and then run it on that specific hardware or simulate it. And we would not just get accuracy, but we would get accuracy on all of the hardware parameters. So things like latency, power, area, throughput, if you want. So uh, basically, we would have this multiple objectives that speak not just to the neural network's um, uh, parameters, but also to the hardware parameters, because you can change both in that formulation. And so we wanted to try this out. And so um, we made a very simple kind of proof of concept experiment where we had a simple uh, DNN search space. So the deep neural network had three stacks. Each stack had three cells. Uh, and each cell had kind of this searchable component where you know the algorithm uh, or the search algorithm can change the different operations here and can connect them up in different ways as well. Uh, and this was the only thing that changed. And then it was repeated in the network. Uh, and, and we also took kind of an open source um, hardware, I should, I should write its name here, uh, called ChaiDNN uh, from Xilinx. And so it was a very simple accelerator that works on uh, Zinc FPGA, I think. Um, and the idea was um, that it had some configurable parameters. And we thought for this proof of concept experiment, we will just expose those very simple configurable parameters to the search problem and see what we get. And so it was things like, you know, buffer depth, um, the parallelization in the convolution engine, the memory interface width, and whether a pooling engine existed or not. So these were basically our parameters and the ranges are annotated here. Very, very simple parameters, nothing fundamental uh, or profound about how we parameterize our hardware. But when you put those parameters with kind of this, uh, the neural network parameters together, we already had like 3.7 billion valid combinations of deep neural network and hardware together. And we uh, found through enumeration that only 3,000 of them were Pareto optimal. So we were starting, and that's Pareto optimal in terms of accuracy, latency, or area, uh, FPGA area. And so we, were, we already said, you know, it's very hard to find this, uh, to find these Pareto optimal points. It's like a needle in a haystack, basically. And so we were getting more confidence that, you know, compared to a hand optimized and hand designed neural network and a hand optimized hand designed hardware i think we can do better so we ran an actual search to compare this and as i said you know this um, this accelerator we were using was actually hand designed to run resnet and google nets and here i'm showing them on an accuracy kind of efficiency plot um, so efficiency as in performance per area in this case and so when we ran our co-designed framework uh, after a few iterations, we found uh, this network that we called COD1, and it was already dominating kind of the ResNet cell running on this hand-tuned accelerator for it. Um, and then, um, and it was dominating it in, in, in terms of both uh, accuracy and area uh, and performance per area at the same time. So we improved accuracy by about 2% while, while simultaneously improving efficiency by 40%. Um, and so we thought that was a great result. When we continued to run our tool, we also dominated the Google Net cell uh, by a smaller margin, but it was still better than hand, the hand designed uh, alternative. And so the key takeaway here is that, you know, just by um, exposing these um, um, architecture parameters, these hardware parameters to an automated uh, search um, uh, formulation, we were able to find things that are much better than when we hand optimize the hardware for a specific uh, neural network. Even though that neural network is very you know, widely used and very and has very good accuracy, we still can find something better by just putting them both in a co-design formulation uh, and by running it to discover both automatically um, together. And so, um, um, so you know, DNNs are a very flexible workload. Um, I, I'm, I'm advocating, uh, especially in the case of FPGAs, of, you know, I don't want someone to come and tell me, you know, my DLA can achieve uh, 80 images per second on ResNet 50. Instead, um, if we run this through an automated co-design framework and we expose really non-obvious hardware parameters and detailed hardware parameters to the search problem, I want us to kind of reach a stage where we say, you know, this FPGA can achieve 100 images per second on the task of image net classification, irrespective of what the network looks like. It's, it's just this task. I'm finding the network that works best with my device. 
Um, and we're not quite there yet. So obviously the example I showed is where we only expose some parameters of a predefined accelerator. But I think the more hardware parameters that we expose to an automated co-design framework, the more we can find you know, non-obvious ways of accelerating this you know, deep neural network workloads uh, onto uh, FPGAs. Um, and of course, you know, a key thing is that you know, GPUs can do this. The hardware is fixed. And so FPGAs are the only device to, that we can use for this kind of uh, customization. OK, so now quickly on to the second thing that I want to talk about, uh, logic neural networks. Um, and so, <clears throat> uh, so I'm showing a diagram here of you know, a neural network. Um, and neural networks have this mathematical abstraction, right? Um, so they're formed of multiplications, they're formed of additions and nonlinear functions. And the key thing, the key reason for using this mathematical abstraction is because, you know, we, first of all, we can understand it. And uh, second of all, it's differentiable. We can train it using backpropagation, which is the main reason, you know, deep neural networks work and they can do different tasks. Uh, but through, you know, a process uh, that, you know, called, is called synthesis, we can transform this network. Uh, let's say if we're kind of unrolling it completely and synthesizing the whole thing um, into a circuit netlist uh, formed out of lookup tables. And so, um, so there was a paper, LotNet, by you know Erwin Wang, James Davis, Peter Chung, and George Kostantinidis. A really amazing paper that changed my view of how I look at these deep neural networks. Um, and they looked at the circuit netlist and they thought you know, we can also train the circuit netlist. So let's go through an example here of kind of a uh, one input LUT. You can write it out as an equation with these C parameters deciding on whether that LUT uh, implements like a straight through wire or a NOT gate. So these are the two options here. And what they found in their, or what they proposed in their LUT papers that we can interpolate between those discrete points uh, that are implemented by the LUT using something called Lagrange interpolating polynomial to allow us to implement a continuous backward function uh, using uh, real valued um, you know, gradients and real valued um, uh, activations. And so, so now I'm not looking at this and saying, you know, this is a circuit netlist. Um, now this is also differentiable and I can also train this. So this is just another neural network just formed of much finer grained components. Um, and I can still train it and I can still kind of reason about it in, in the same way. Um, so let me kind of talk about uh, this work that we did together. Um, you know, if you have a deep neural network, I'm showing here a single dot product of that deep neural network where X's are, you know, my activations, W's are my weights, you have multiplications, and then in addition, you can binarize this deep neural network, uh, basically an extreme form of quantization, which makes the X's and W's into a single bit each, uh, changing those multipliers into X nor gates. And that's great. That's something that, you know, again, we can accelerate on FPGAs quite well because it's kind of the only suitable platform uh, for BNN acceleration. I don't think there are any other chips that are suited for bit operations uh, as well. Uh, but a key problem of BNNs is that they have this really huge fan in here. Uh, even though we made this operation, uh, we simplified it all the way, you know, from a multiplication into a simple uh, single logic gate or one bit multiplier. Uh, we still have this very high fan in here, uh, which usually, um, you know, um, is the bottleneck for these BNN implementations on FPGAs. And what um, what the Imperial uh, group did in their lot network is that they managed to change this BNN um, representation into something they called LUTNET, in which they replaced these uh, XNOR gates with, uh, you know, multi-input lookup tables, much like the ones you find on your FPGA. And that meant that they were able to kind of increase the logic density of these operations here. And they were able to get, you know, a lower fan in uh, coming into the accumulator here. So they basically, they found, uh, they were able to change um, BNN uh, neural network topology to better fit FPGAs by doing that. And because they were able to train in the LUT domain um, um, using these like branch interpolating polynomials, uh, they did that at no accuracy loss essentially. And so they've reshifted where operations happen. They did the top up training and it still uh, worked as well, but with higher uh, efficiency on the FPGAs. Uh, now, so, uh, so I, I really like this paper. So I actually approached them and we collaborated on a work that we called logic shrinkage. And uh, that was kind of presented in FPGA earlier this year, where we, um, you know, looking at this from a circuit perspective, 
um, I want to be able to optimize that circuit in however way I, I, I like. And then I want to be able to do top-up training for it, which is something I can do now with these Lagrange interpolating polynomials, as I said. So we basically adapted pruning, uh, very fine-grained pruning, actually, uh, very fine-grained activation pruning into this uh, circuit netlist domain. And we pruned away pieces of the circuit, which we thought were uh, not contributing to the function uh, as much. So uh, low saliency inputs basically in our LUTs. Uh, and we were able to do uh, top-up training to kind of regain the accuracy. So what that meant is that, you know, compared to a state-of-the-art BNN, but not just a state-of-the-art BNN, a state-of-the-art BNN that was heavily pruned in the BNN domain, compared to that, our logic shrunk, you know, pruned LotNet was uh, three to five X more area efficient when implemented on the FPGA. And you can think of it as just, you know, uh, we are reorganizing how computations are happening to better fit the FPGA LUTs. And then we are removing all redundant um, computations at this very fundamental, you know, LUT level uh, of FPGAs. And so, so I, think, um, I think this is a very promising direction and one that is uniquely suited to the FPGA fabric, to the programmable FPGA fabric. Um, and so the idea here is looking forward, I want to explore this idea of, you know, having an unrolled neural network Combining that with fine-grained pruning, which you can only kind of take advantage of well with an unrolled neural network, and then with this extra, you know, uh, unique feature of being able to train in the LUT domain, uh, I think we can really translate, you know, a fine-grained neural network that looks much different than what we have today into FPGAs in a very efficient way. Uh, obviously, you can't do this on on GPUs. In fact, when GPUs try to support fine-grained sparsity. Uh, they support a very constrained form of uh, fine grain sparsity in their ampere architecture, where two out of every four elements in a weight matrix had to be zero. Um, and then they kind of stored it in a compressed format and they were able to implement it in their tensor cores in kind of a really efficient way. Um, but for 50% fine grain sparsity, you expect a 2x speed up, right? Uh, but in this case, it was between the speed up according to NVIDIA's own numbers. So this is taken from their blog. Uh, post, uh, it was between 10 and 15 percent. So a very small speed up, a very modest speed up compared to the amount of sparsity here. So I really think kind of going down the path of unrolled neural networks um, and perhaps also leveraging this idea of training in the LUT domain can get us to much finer grained, uh, higher efficiency networks um, in hardware on the FPGA. Um, and I don't think we actually need to stick with the current FPGA fabric um for these kinds of problems and i haven't looked into that yet but you know I'll, I'll just leave you with that question is what if we also change the fpga logic fabric to suit um kind of these logic neural networks uh, this is something i'm really interested in looking at uh, in the near future hopefully okay so so two things two ways of using fpgas for deep learning which i think works really well now with the third one is actually the most relevant one to the Crossroads uh, Research Center. Uh, and I'll talk about kind of FPGA DLA devices. Uh, so I'll start by saying, you know, that um, deep learning is heterogeneous. Uh, so, so far I've been focusing on this concept of a deep neural network, um, but that's only one piece of a deep learning workload. If you look at that, uh, what happens in a data center or even on your phone or anywhere, uh, the DNN does not live in isolation. There's stuff that happens before, uh, things like you know packet processing, uh, compression, encryption, data augmentation, data manipulations, and so on. And there's stuff that happens after as well, as a result of whatever the deep neural network predicts or um, or finds. And so, um, so people are starting to realize that. And there is this paper from Google trying to quantify um, what is the percentage percent of time spent in the input pipeline. Um, of uh, common deep learning workloads. So they profiled their deep learning workloads in their data center. This is a CDF, uh, cumulative distributed distribution function of what they found. And what they found is that on average, 30% of the time is spent in the input pipeline. So it's not a small number. And for 20% of the workload, there was this long tail distribution where 20% of the work, 20% uh, of, of their jobs basically uh, consumed more than 35% in their input pipeline, up to, I guess, 100% uh, in this case. Uh, a separate study that focused on training specifically 
um, found that you know between 50 and 65 percent of each epoch of training was spent doing other stuff other than the forward pass, the backward pass, and the parameter update. It was spent, you know, sampling the mini batch. It was spent on data manipulations and data augmentations and things like that. And so there is a lot of overhead there. Um, and it's not because you know I'm not speeding up my neural net deep neural network well. It's because I'm neglecting all these other parts, right? So you know my talk so far has been focused on the DNN and how to build hardware for the DNN. And the focus of most talks and most groups are actually um, um, and most startups are exactly that. You know, focusing on the deep neural network. You know, but what happens to everything else? In modern data centers, um, everything else usually falls back to a CPU. Um, and I have nothing against CPUs. They are very important components in the data center. They run the operating system. And they need to be very general and very robust. But because of that, uh, for these data intensive kind of functions, things like packet processing, inline uh, compression and encryption, data manipulations, they are actually very slow. Uh, they also have unpredictable latency because of this, you know, they have to do all of this other stuff as well, like an operating system. And so at this point, I kind of just want to quickly review Andal's law. So going back to our undergraduate degrees, you know, we, we studied this law and it, it's, it's always kind of um, a hindsight thing, I find, uh, at least what I found when I was in industry, people think about it after the fact. Uh, but uh, I think with deep learning, we can kind of try to take into, into account uh, in the beginning by uh, exploring deep learning applications end to end. And I'm, I'll just give an example here is, if I speed up my deep neural network by an order of magnitude by 10x, then my overall application speed up will just be limited to 2.7x, 2.7 times. And that's assuming you know uh, this 30% number that I showed in the previous slide that I'm spending 30% of the time in pre-processing. No matter how fast I make the deep neural network, I'm kind of limited asymptotically by about 3x um, application speed up. So the question here now is how can we optimize the system architecture to accelerate not just a deep neural network, but the end-to-end -end kind of deep learning workload? Um, and so how can we think about not just the DLA uh, or not just the GPU or ASIC, but about the whole system um, in that context. Of course, you might expect that what I'll say next is, you know, let's replace that software fallback with hardware acceleration. And, you know, um, I, I think there is a, a necessity for having kind of a purpose-built single function deep learning accelerator uh, that's built on an ASIC and that runs really efficiently for dense linear algebra. Because it turns out that that's the main workload in deep neural networks. No matter how many new layers people come up with, that's the main thing that we're doing there. Um, so we need that, but um, we, we also need something for everything else. We don't want to have the software fallback for everything else. We want something that matches the bandwidth and the line rate of data going into that DLA. And it's able to keep up with computations happening there. And so, um, so I think FPGAs are the only uh, reasonable solution there, just because of the reconfigurable hardware. We can, um, we can build an ASIC for certain functions here, but it will always, like you always have, you know, different functions and new things that come up that are, cannot be accelerated um, with kind of a fixed function accelerator. We need programmable hardware to become the norm um, in data centers for that reason. Um, and, you know, I worked a bit on kind of accelerating various uh, relevant applications onto FPGAs. One of them was DZIP compression, where we were able to achieve like a 20 times performance per watt improvement versus a kind of a zero load um, Intel CPU server, a high end server um, apart from Intel. And so, um, so I don't think I need to convince you too much that. Um, hardware acceleration on FPGAs can outperform CPUs in these data intensive functions quite easily. If you, if you follow this seminar, also uh, James's group um, and others talked about uh, Pegasus where you, know, you get a two, order, two orders of magnitude improvement in uh, something like network intrusion detection. And kind of the list goes on. There are so many applications that fit exactly in this step of pre-processing uh, in deep neural networks that would be uh, quite like accelerated quite a bit by just floating them onto an FPJ instead of a CPU. Um, and you know, in industry, people are not kind of um, 
people are noticing this, right? And so you'll find in Microsoft, SBJs are already kind of in all of their data centers. Um, NVIDIA also recently is trying to kind of sidestep the CPU bottleneck in data centers by at attaching a GPU directly to their kind of Mellanox switches, so these Connect uh, 7 switches um, um, that are uh, used in data centers. So instead of, you know, conventionally, you would have a, CPU, a GPU attached off of the PCIe link from the uh, CPU here. But in that case, you know, it's, it's uh, network attached. And so data would come in and it would be accelerated here right away. Um, there are also these um, A caps uh, presented by, you know, uh, invented by Xilinx, right? Where you have these a dedicated AI engines or a deep learning accelerator uh, with the FPGA soft logic on a single uh, device. Uh, and I'm really interested in that last one. Um, and this notion of, you know, hybrid FPGA DLA devices. Uh, I think, um, as I said before, like deep learning is a heterogeneous workload. It has other stuff other than the deep neural network. And so if I want to accelerate it, I want a device that can accelerate all pieces of that workload. And so I really think, you know, the FPGA is the right um, device there. And so we can use it to kind of implement uh, various custom uh, pre-processing or post-processing that needs to be tightly coupled with uh, the deep neural network um, on the FPGA part. And then we can have a purpose-built single function. It doesn't have to be single function. It can be somewhat programmable as well, but a purpose-built deep learning accelerator on the other side um, to, um, to accelerate the deep neural network itself. And so there are many research questions here, and um, the rest of this talk will not provide answers to all of them because this is kind of my current slash future work over the next few years, hopefully. Um, but, you know, how do we change the FPGA architecture and how do we uh, do its CAD, um, you know, um, in, this new, in, in this new hybrid device? What design style do we adopt, kind of? How do we compile uh, applications to it? This is something I started looking into uh, with my collaborators. Basically, do we have two separate uh, compilers for each part and then we stitch them up somehow? Or can we maybe even have a single compiler that partitions an application automatically onto these two parts? Um, let's, you know, uh, prototype some applications to see if we actually need that tight coupling or if other um, architectures are going to be used. So we need kind of an architecture exploration framework uh, for these hybrid FPGA DLA devices as well. What does the DLA architecture look like? I mean, many DLA architectures exist, um, but none that have this fine-grained access to programmable logic. And so this one will probably look a bit different. And so we need to think about that quite carefully as well. What happens with the memory hierarchy? Do we share memory between those two parts? Do we have memory coherency? Uh, or or what, what are we doing there? Or are they completely kind of separate memory banks? Um, and finally, the interconnection network. And that's actually where I do have some work um, that brings me kind of all the way back to my PhD. Um, so, uh, so in the next couple of slides, I'll talk about what I think is the right interconnection network for this kind of device, um, which is embedded networks on chip uh, for FPGAs. And so the idea there was that, you know, um, when I started my PhD back in 2011, 2012, um, FPGAs were becoming large enough to be useful for, um, for kind of computing applications. Right for compute, not just for you know glue logic or protocol translation or various kind of communication cores, which is where FPGAs usually play. Uh, but they were getting large enough to implement kind of various you know scientific applications and things, obviously like deep neural network and compression and, and uh, network intrusion detection and all of that stuff. But an FPGA designer had to worry about so many things. They had to worry about their application logic in terms of building the hardware for it. They had to worry about the system level interconnect connect pieces of their application. They had to worry about connections to external interfaces, things like uh, memory controllers and PCIe transceivers and you know Ethernet. And they had to close timing. Timing closure is a huge issue, something that's kind of um, very few people can do efficiently and well. And so we thought that we would try to solve all these problems by removing the worry of kind of the, um, the FPGA designer around the system level interconnects. We would build that for them. It would be very high bandwidth. It would be connected to these external interfaces and it would really help in, um, in, in, in shifting the focus of an application developer into just worrying about the application logic itself. Uh, so I'll attempt to kind of summarize my, um, my five years of PhD into one slide. But basically, we looked first at, this, uh, at the NOC architecture itself, 
what kind of virtual channels do we use, what kind of allocation and switching policies uh, would work well, and then the efficiency of implementing this um, um, network on chip, whether, uh, whether hard or soft on the FPGA. We found that you know a hard network on chip that's clocked at a very high fixed frequency uh, was the best way to do it. But then the next question was, you know, how do we connect that to the FPGA fabric? So we have this high frequency uh, NOC, and we want to connect it to a programmable soft, um, you know, FPGA module that can have any kind of data width and any frequency. So we built a very flexible kind of fabric port, like a kind of the on-ramp and the off-ramp from and to the network on chip to the uh, FPGA fabric. And obviously we had like, um, basically handling back pressure from the network on chip, um, clock uh, crossing clock domains, uh, adapting the width and packetizing the data into that component. Uh, and it turned out to be uh, quite essential. And then finally, we, uh, we, we started worrying about the design styles. How do we support latency sensitive design on, on the network on chip? Can we reserve kind of certain virtual channels and have quality of service guarantees? Uh, how do we support both streaming and transaction communication onto the network on chip, like re response request kind of a master slave communication? Um, and so we built all of that into kind of a CAD system where we identified kind of um, the communication patterns on a data flow graph. We did a clustering step and then mapped different modules onto the network on chip and finally created some uh, traffic managers to allow kind of uh, the use of this shared interconnect resource on the FPGA. Uh, quite efficiently. And the final comparison was kind of taking all of this, taking this embedded network on chip with the CAD flow and with, you know, the fabric port and everything, comparing it to commercial um, bus-based interconnect generation tools. Uh, we were uh, about three times faster in terms of uh, frequency, uh, or up to three times faster, I should say, and up to 78 times smaller. So the interconnect overhead was much smaller when we do that. Uh, so this kind of hopefully should convince you that we should put uh, embedded network on chip on our FPGA to handle system level communication. But to take it a step further, we also kind of prototyped a bunch of relevant applications. Um, and they are relevant also for kind of the uh, this idea of pre-processing in deep neural networks. I didn't know at the time that they were relevant, but uh, they're now relevant in retrospect. Um, things like, you know, JPEG compression, for example. We were able to show that with the network on chip, the design can be much more predictable and we can have a much higher frequency if we use an NOC. We looked into Ethernet switching, and um, because we can use the network on chip as a switch, essentially, as a hardened switch on the FPGA, uh, we were able to achieve uh, way more switching than was previously possible on the FPGA. We were able to almost match the transceiver bandwidth that uh, generation of FPGAs, actually. And finally, we looked at packet processing with my collaborator at the time, Andrew, uh, and he showed that he can build kind of 100 gigabit per second uh, packet processor on the FPGA with much higher throughput and smaller area than what we can do previously. And so I'm, I'm getting close to the end of my talk now, but basically um, what I just talked about was, you know, how we can uh, use an NOC enabled FPGA uh, to connect to uh, to implement uh, important pre and post processing functions um, of um, a deep learning workload and connect that efficiently to uh, in an abstract way to um, to a deep learning accelerator that is really focused on you know the deep neural network part uh, and so I, I think that um, uh, that's kind of an amazing device to uh, continue to look at in the context of accelerating these deep learning applications uh, end to end. And so uh, and so that's it really, that's all I have uh, for today. Um, so to answer the question, is there still hope for FPGAs? Yes, there is a lot of hope. I think FPGAs are wonderful reconfigurable devices and there are so many things that we can do with them. Uh, we're barely just scratching the surface. Um, I talked first about you know this idea of automated code design. Um, the fact that we can change um, both the neural network and the hardware to fit each other in the same problem formulation can get us to kind of new ways of uh, accelerating these neural networks in hardware. And then I talked about logic neural networks where we have this profound thing of being able to retrain a circuit netlist. So imagine what optimizations we can do at the netlist level and at the lot level 
that we can then um, do and then regain accuracy by performing this retraining step. Uh, and finally, I talked about FPGA DLA devices as potentially the ultimate devices to kind of accelerate deep learning applications end to end um, and to, um, um, to really replace this idea of software fallback in modern data centers. Uh, and throughout this talk, I've been kind of trying to see, okay, what is the key property of FPGAs that allows it to kind of work really well? And I didn't find anything more profound than just the fact that it's reconfigurable. It's hardware and it's reconfigurable. That's the only thing, uh, that's the only kind of device that you can use uh, for that, uh, with that property. Uh, so I should also mention at this point that this has been kind of a walkthrough of my personal work uh, with lots of collaborators, of course, but there are so many other interesting data points out there. I was hoping to make the slide deck a bit more complete and talk about other people's work as well, um, but it's just I didn't have time to put it all together. So this is just an acknowledgement that this, um, uh, the things I presented are some ways of using FPGAs, but there are a lot of other interesting and uh, potentially better ways of using FPGAs as well uh, that are out there uh, for deep learning. So that's all I had. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, at this point.